Now we're going to move on to our next speaker in imaging, Javier Villanueva Meyer, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging here at UCSF, and also will be the future director of MRI. Today, he's going to be talking to us about advanced imaging technologies for brain tumor patients. Thank you, Nancy Ann, for uh, the introduction. Let me get started here. Is it play? All right. Fantastic. Um, thank you again for the invitation to, to speak before this group. I'm going to be talking about advanced imaging technologies for uh, brain tumors. These are, this is my one disclosure. I would like to give a shout out at this time to, I think there is someone or a couple of people from Peru as a Peruvian. Hello, bienvenidos. Um, as soon me just went over very elegantly, there are a lot of limitations to standard of care imaging. Uh, cases where we're sort of left scratching our head. Uh, at the top here, we see T2 flare images. And unfortunately, findings that are right on T2 flare uh, may represent any number of pathologies that would require different management. And the same is true for contrast enhancement, where you can have increasing contrast enhancement, both in the setting of progressive tumor, as well as in the setting of treatment effect. So given that standard of care imaging is not sensitive or specific, what can we do to um, better understand what's going on in the brain with imaging. This is what I think our clinical needs are. We need a way to better evaluate novel therapies, monitor treatment response, detect malignant transformation, identify cancer mimics, and help us with diagnosis. <clears throat> and I think it would be fantastic if we had a way to differentiate true progression from pseudo progression, of course, identify tumor mimics, and maybe come to diagnosis without needing to, um, to have tissue. So for example, at the bottom right here, a patient with uh, a GBM, however neurologically intact, can we spare that patient's surgery? Can we inform with non-invasive imaging? So today I'm gonna to give you a whirlwind tour of uh, some of the work that we do here at UCSF, some of the projects that we're excited about um, across a, a number of different domains. One, how we integrate machine learning using some of the techniques that uh, Sun Mi mentioned uh, into clinical practice. We'll talk about uh, molecular imaging with PET or positron emission tomography, as well as hyperpolarized carbon imaging. <clears throat> so with regards to integrating machine learning, I'm gonna share with you a project that we're, we're developing within our Center for Intelligent Imaging uh, on automated segmentation of glioma to detect progression. As everyone uh, on this call probably knows tumor monitoring is based on qualitative measures typically you know, the radiologist the neuro-oncologist neurosurgeon is looking at a tumor is it bigger is it smaller or is it bigger is it the same hard to really know enter rano criteria to help us um, but those still are somewhat subjective and the reality for us here at ucsf is that neuro-oncology orders 2500 mris per year that breaks down to about almost seven mris per day so this is a fairly large chunk of our volume. So how can we um, use, use new technologies to help us do our job uh, better, faster, and safer? So here I'll share with you a collaboration that we have, uh, again, through the Center for Intelligent Imaging with uh, NVIDIA on, um, on automated segmentation of gliomas. And let me share that with you via this video. This is what the process would look like. So this is our PACS. We send the images to, <clears throat> to um, our server where the uh, images are uh, uh, processed and a segmentation is generated. As you can see, the segmentation is running now. This is about 1.5 speed, uh, but it is very fast as you can imagine. We can then review the images and review the images with the overlaid segmentation, as you can see. Not perfect, so we have the ability to segment, to edit these uh, and retrain uh, our model. And we also can provide feedback to our uh, computer scientist here, as you can see this T2 flare assessment, and we can say needs minor adjustment and make the edits and retrain our model that way. So far, we're pretty happy with where we're at. Of course, we have a long ways to go but um, we're getting pretty good uh, dice coefficients, so a measure of similarity between standard or, or gold standard. Uh, it's integrated into our, our clinical workflow validations underway, and we're looking to apply this to other brain tumors. And it brings to mention, you know, what is 
our imaging workflow look like in 2021 versus five years from now? It'd be interesting to see where that goes. Making a, a hard left turn here to PET or positron emission tomography, there's a lot available. Uh, lots of work has been done in this space. Highlighted in bold here are some of the radio tracers we've evaluated at UCSF. Uh, and I'll show you <clears throat> some select examples from that. Amino acid PET is a broad class of uh, PET uh, agents or represent a broad class of PET, PET agents which enter the cells via these amino acid transporters. They all work very similarly. Uh, there's certainly, you know, there's a lot of debate about which one of these different agents is better. And the reality is whatever agent is available to you is going to be uh, the, the one that you should, you should use. There are um, a lot of opportunities to use this tool uh, all the way from treatment planning to treatment monitoring, as you can see here and is outlined in this uh, nice paper that was published in Neuro-Oncology several years ago now. So these are some examples from uh, the UCSF experience. This is work that uh, Sunmi Chan, Marian Maboyan, and Ramon Barajas did uh, a number of years ago. This is F-DOPA, uh, one of the amino acid radio tracers. Here we can see that there is uh, elevated uptake within this region of enhancing uh, tumor. However, it also calls out an area of non-enhancing disease that uh, would have otherwise been potentially missed. So a great way to supplement um, standard or conventional imaging. Another example of a patient who had some growth in contrast enhancement over a six month period, we see relatively minimal uptake and I'll show you here something from a practical perspective that I really like about this radio tracer. There is an internal control. So F-DOPA uh, is part of the dopaminergic or is used in the dopaminergic uh, metabolic system. And so as a result, you have uptake within the corpus striatum and you can use this as an internal reference. And so here we see that uptake is less than that internal reference standard. And we can suggest that this is probably not metabolically active tumor. Sure enough, this patient goes to biopsy or to resection and uh, the result is that this is radiation treatment effect. So nice example of that. More recently, we've become interested in using fluorethyl tyrosine or FET. Uh, a couple of examples here. This is a patient who has two lesions, uh, one that's new, that developed around the periventricular white matter, as well as some enhancement around the resection cavity. This grows um, by imaging, we call this uh, new lesion indeterminate and the lesion uh, around the temporal lobe uh, unchanged and probably related to treatment. On uh, FET PET, we notice that there's low uptake in both of these lesions, consistent with treatment-related changes in both lesions. This patient has a follow-up. The lesion continues to grow. Uh, as you me showed the utility of perfusion, here we see that there is no elevated perfusion. We do a delayed post-contrast image that shows continued enhancement of the lesion. Again, all findings consistent with treatment effect. This patient goes on to surgery and that is concordant, ends up being treatment effect. As I showed you with F-DOPA, this is an example where FET-PET can be, or was helpful, incredibly helpful for us in terms of identifying a second site disease. Here we have <clears throat> the area around the resection cavity that's metabolically active, but there is a little area of elevated uh, uptake that comes back, um, uh, it, it comes back in the indeterminate range when we look at it, we this is early on in our, in our experience, and we thought maybe this is a vascular lesion. Here you can see there's a corresponding flare signal abnormality within it. Looking back at imaging from eight weeks prior, uh, that lesion was not there. This is the FET PET again, and an eight-week follow-up, the cat's out of the bag here. This is very clearly tumor progression. So this is a very informative and instructive case for us, much like that F-DOPA case, trust in the PET. If you see something abnormal, go back and look closely and scrutinize those images because sure enough, there was an area of flare that had very small and subtle that was not present on the eight weeks prior. Now beyond amino acid radio tracers, these are radio tracers that obviously have a lot of, um, there's a lot of experience, particularly in the European uh, and Asian literature. Uh, we um, are also looking at probing additional pathways. Uh, for example, the iron uh, mimetic gallium citrate uh, binds to transferrin and can be uh, and binds to uh, with increased avidity to cells that have uh, greater expression of the transferrin receptor complex, which is related to mTOR pathway activation, which we see in cancer. This uh, is an example case uh, from a series that we did in patients with 
uh, with high-grade glioma, and we can see that there's uptake not just within the enhancing lesion, but also in non-enhancing components uh, of this tumor. We have uh, a second-generation version of this product that we're actually currently uh, getting ready to launch a trial on, so we're very excited about that. <clears throat> Beyond PET imaging, we also explore uh, metabolic imaging with hyperpolarized carbon, which is another way to look at dynamic metabolism. So these are some examples of uh, FTG PET, so uh, glucose PET, and how it's evolved over the years. And you can see that we've come a long way over the last 30 years or 40 years or so with regards to image quality. Uh, before, we were able to roughly make out the brain, and now uh, we have very, very fine detailed anatomy of the brain. And hyperpolarized carbon is in a similar sort of uh, state of infancy as, as FDG was maybe 20, 30 years ago. Um, and let me share with you what exactly or how exactly this technology works. So what we do with hyperpolarized carbon imaging in particular, hyperpolarized carbon pyruvate, which is what we uh, use to image cancer here at UCSF uh, and at a few select centers uh, across the world, is we take uh, something that exists in, in relative scarcity, uh, in this case, uh, the carbon-13 uh, isotope, and we enrich that, uh, that uh, within solution. And then we apply dynamic nuclear polarization, which is a process uh, that happens at very, very low temperatures to increase the number of spins that are aligned. And this is important for us from an imaging perspective, from a magnetic resonance imaging perspective, because this is how we're going to detect signal. And what then happens is we can now real time watch as something that's labeled with hyperpolarized carbon, in this case, pyruvate, goes through its metabolic processes. Uh, and it gets converted to alanine, uh, lactate, and bicarbonate. Um, and so this allows us to look at aerobic glycolysis and cancer. And I recognize this is a brain tumor uh, symposium, and this is not a brain, but I think it highlights nicely what we can detect with this technology. So here we see a normal prostate, and we see uh, a peak for pyruvate and a peak for lactate. And as you notice, that lactate peak actually gets higher in uh, as you go into more progressively uh, um, uh, aggressive tumors. And this is kind of what we're seeing when I mentioned dynamic imaging. This is what we see. So we're able to image over time. This is from zero to two minutes here. And pyruvate uh, goes, signal goes down and we see an elevation in lactate signal and we can watch that conversion real time. And that's what we're aiming to probe with this versus say a standard uh, MR spectroscopy which, is, uh, which measures steady state metabolism. So we're funded by a number of uh, uh, mechanisms, as you can see here, with a number of PIs. We've scanned over 40 patients with glioma, uh, 120 total scans, made lots of improvements to hardware. As you can see here on screen right, this is a new coil that we developed with our funding uh, that allows us to image not just the carbon nucleus, but also the proton nucleus at the same time. And the proton nucleus is what we image during routine MRI. So this is, uh, allows us the opportunity or affords us the opportunity to image both uh, hyperpolarized carbon as well as a standard of care MRI at the same setting without taking somebody on and off the table or putting on a new coil. Uh, we've improved, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead here. We've improved our spatial resolution, but as you can see, we're still not quite where we wanna be. Uh, 1.5 by 1.5 by 1.5 is certainly not a small uh, lesion. We need to, um, we're, we're working to do better. Uh, we've done several volunteer studies that show that we consistently can image uh, the, the normal brain and that these metabolites are consistent across the normal brain. Uh, we've been able to show that tumors that are uh, progressive have greater conversion of lactate. So at the top, this person has greater conversion of lactate compared to this person at the bottom. Um, and we've been able to look at several interesting patterns of progression, certainly progressive disease with elevated uh, lactate production, but also non-enhancing disease with elevated lactate uh, as depicted by this uh, image on the right, as well as on the bottom where you see elevated lactate throughout areas of non-enhancing disease. We've also noticed interesting whole brain changes. This is a person who had chemo radiotherapy and you can see that their tumor goes away between uh, post-surgical and post-chemo radiotherapy, but also their changes in the whole brain metabolism. That's something we're seeking to explore. 
Another example of whole brain metabolic changes following antiangiogenic therapy, as you can see here in the bottom, where there's much greater conversion to lactate throughout the whole brain. So what do these changes mean? Uh, is something that we're interested in understanding more. Moving into the future, we're interested in looking at uh, C2 pyruvate, which goes through the TCA cycle and allows us to see additional metabolites beyond just what we can see with C1 pyruvate. And that's just a difference in which carbon position we label. These are some of our early experiments. We can see now glutamate metabolism, which again, we're very excited about. And we can delve down into even more specific imaging. This is uh, uh, hyperpolarizing now alpha ketoglutarate, which uh, as you uh, are aware, and as Sunmi mentioned in her last talk, uh, is part of the metabolic pathway that yields this oncometabolite and IDH mutant tumors. And we can watch alpha ketoglutarate get converted to 2-HG in IDH mutant tumors, whereas we don't see that in IDH wild type tumors. Very interesting stuff. Um, so just in closing, some of my initial thoughts with regards to metabolic imaging, it's not always as straightforward as it seems. I've shown you very select examples. I think that there's a huge uh, importance to multidisciplinary review, right? Engaging our neuro-oncology, neurosurgery, radiation oncology, and pathology co uh, colleagues. Um, but it does provide, these, these techniques provide exciting uh, information. And I think that when you see findings here, we need to make sure that we re-review the standard of care MRI and we need to have ongoing discussions about interpretation guidelines. Now, this is all easier said than done, but there is huge potential here. Um, I think that uh, this really does require a team effort. If you build it, they will come is really the exception and not the rule. And uh, for those of you seeking to start and embark on projects like these, the functional clinical service really does lead to future research success. Remember the site volume is driven by what you're doing in the clinic. Uh, and again, I cannot uh, uh, overemphasize the need to go to multidisciplinary conferences and demonstrate value. These are expensive techniques, but new therapies cost much, much more and keep investing in that innovation. So with that, um, I'll close and say, you know, the reason that I think people come to us and other academic medical centers, we have high quality standard of care MRI, provide advanced physiologic MRI, as well as cutting edge imaging uh, when necessary. And uh, I'll thank all of our collaborators. I'm sure I've, I've missed plenty of you here. And I put a link out to uh, the Center for Intelligent Imaging, as well as our hyperpolarized MRI technology resource center. So with that, thank you again uh, for your time uh, and I'll happy, happily answer any questions in the chat.